Tonight, the I-team has a letter from El Chapo in which he implies that U.S. prison officials are bullying him because he has escaped before. Nobody's ever broken out of the Supermax prison here in Colorado. The notorious drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman has sent an SOS message to Mexico's president, claiming that he is suffering from psychological torment in a U.S. prison. But is this a genuine plea for help or a cunning scheme to escape from custody once again, especially during the intensifying U.S.-Mexico border crisis? Let's analyze the disturbing message El Chapo sent about the U.S.-Mexico border. SOS message. Joaquin El Chapo Guzman is a name that strikes fear into the hearts of many. For decades, he reigned over the Sinaloa cartel, Mexico's most powerful organized crime group. His empire was built on drug trafficking, money laundering, and even homicide. El Chapo's journey to the ADX Florence Supermax prison in Florence, Colorado, began with his arrest in 2016. After years of evading capture, he was finally apprehended and extradited to the United States to face charges of drug trafficking, money laundering, and weapons-related offenses offenses. But now, behind the cold steel bars of the ADX Florence Supermax in Colorado, Guzman finds himself in a desperate situation. While serving his life sentence in a maximum security prison in the United States, El Chapo has been subjected to strict confinement measures that have raised concerns about his well-being and human rights. El Chapo has sent an urgent SOS message to the President of Mexico, Andres Manuel López Obrador, pleading for repatriation to his home country on humanitarian grounds. El Chapo's plea emphasizes his deteriorating physical and mental health, as well as the inhumane conditions he is subjected to in the U.S. prison. He claims that his health is rapidly declining and expresses genuine fear that he may not survive his sentence if he remains in the United States Supermax prison. According to his lawyer, Jose Refugio Rodriguez, Guzman is only allowed outside three times a week to a small area where he doesn't get the sun. This limited access to fresh air and natural light can have detrimental effects on both physical and mental health. The lack of sunlight and fresh air can lead to vitamin D deficiency efficiency, weakened immune system, and increased risk of depression and anxiety. Guzman has been deprived of necessities such as adequate access to sunlight, visitation rights, proper food, and even medical care. He wasn't allowed to the rooftop sports courts to exercise. Prison authorities said there was too much risk that the cartel boss would be picked off by a sniper or would stage a helicopter escape. In a disturbing revelation, Rodriguez revealed that Guzman had a problem with his molars. Instead of receiving proper treatment, his teeth were forcibly removed to prevent any complaints. These allegations have sparked outrage and concern, not only among Guzman's supporters, but also among those who believe in upholding human rights. Furthermore, El Chapo has fewer visits or phone calls than other inmates, further exacerbating his sense of isolation and disconnection from the outside world. This isolation can take a toll on his mental well-being, as human connection and social interaction are essential for maintaining psychological health. The drug lord's request for repatriation is not a plea for release or a reduction in his sentence. Instead, it is a desperate plea for better living conditions and access to proper medical care while serving his sentence. El Chapo believes that serving his sentence in Mexico would provide him with a chance to receive the medical attention he needs and be closer to his family. These strict confinement measures have sparked debates about the ethics of such conditions, especially for a high-profile prisoner like El Chapo. While it is important to ensure the prison's security and prevent any potential escape attempts, it is also crucial to uphold hold basic human rights and provide dignified treatment to all prisoners. What he's seeking and what this seeks is, it's another bite at the apple. He lost his trial, he lost on appeal, but this is a mechanism for him to say, despite all of that, I'm still entitled to a reversal of my conviction and a new trial because my constitutional rights were violated. President Lopez Obrador, known as AMLO by many, has always emphasized the importance of human rights. In response to Guzman's plea, he stated that you always have to keep the door open when it comes to human rights. This statement has ignited a fierce debate among the Mexican public. Supporters of Guzman argue that he deserves a chance at redemption and rehabilitation, while others believe that his crimes are too severe to warrant any leniency. The president's decision carries significant weight as it could set a precedent for how Mexico deals with high-profile criminals in the future. It is important to consider the complexity of Guzman's case. Throughout his criminal career, he had deep connections with Mexico's government and security forces. His multiple escapes from custody have embarrassed authorities and raised concerns about the ongoing risk of escape. Additionally, the United States and Mexico have an agreement in place that allows prisoners to serve their sentences in the other country to be closer to their families. However, given the severity of Guzman's crimes and the potential security risks, it seems highly unlikely that the U.S. would agree to such a deal. 
the U.S.-Mexican border crisis. Now, if you have been following the ongoing U.S.-Mexico border crisis, you would know it didn't just emerge overnight. It is rooted in a complex history of political, economic, and social factors that have shaped the relationship between these two neighboring nations. In the post-World War II era, the Bracero Program was established in 1942 to address labor shortages in the United States. This program allowed Mexican agricultural workers to enter the country temporarily to work in the fields. However, it also created a system of exploitation and abuse, with workers often facing low wages, poor living conditions, and limited rights. In the 1990s, the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, was implemented, aiming to promote economic integration between the United States, Mexico, and Canada. While NAFTA promised economic growth and job opportunities, it also led to the displacement of small-scale Mexican farmers who couldn't compete with subsidized U.S. agricultural products. This displacement, coupled with the lack of economic opportunities, pushed many Mexicans to seek better prospects north of the border. The turn of the millennium brought heightened security concerns for the United States, particularly after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. The creation of the Department of Homeland Security in 2003 and the implementation of the Secure Fence Act in 2006 marked a significant increase in border enforcement measures. The construction of physical barriers, surveillance technology, and the deployment of more Border Patrol agents aimed to deter unauthorized crossings. Despite these efforts, the border crisis continued to escalate. The drug cartels in Mexico gained power and influence, leading to increased violence and instability. This, coupled with the persistent economic disparities and the allure of the American dream, fueled a continuous flow of migrants attempting to enter the United States. In 2018, the Trump administration implemented a zero-tolerance policy, resulting in the separation of thousands of migrant families at the border. This controversial policy drew international condemnation and further intensified the debate surrounding immigration policies. With the change in administration, the Biden administration has taken a different approach, focusing on more humane and compassionate policies. Now, one day, on day one, I'm going to send a legislative immigration reform bill to Congress to provide a roadmap to citizenship for 11 million undocumented immigrants who contribute so much to this country, including 1.7 million, 1.7 million AAPI. However, the challenges of managing the border crisis persist, with a surge in migrant arrivals and the need to balance border security with humanitarian considerations. If you're trying to leave Cuba, Nicaragua, or Haiti, you have, and we, or have agreed to begin a journey to America, do not, do not just show up at the border. Stay where you are and apply legally from there. Starting today. One of the key challenges is the rise in unaccompanied minors arriving at the border. These vulnerable children often undertake perilous journeys, seeking safety and a better future. The facilities designed to house them have been stretched beyond capacity, leading to overcrowding and inadequate living conditions. Another challenge is the increase in asylum seekers. Many individuals and families fleeing violence, persecution, and economic hardships in their home countries seek refuge in the United States. However, the asylum process is complex and time-consuming, leading to a backlog of cases and prolonged stays in detention centers. Efforts are being made to streamline the asylum process and provide fair and efficient adjudication of claims. In response to the crisis, the Biden administration has implemented several policies. The Title 42 Public Health Order, initially introduced during the Trump administration in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, allows for the expulsion of migrants at the border without due process. Under Title 42, migrants encountered at the U.S.-Mexico border were faced with a grim reality. They were either returned to their home countries or sent back to Mexico. The numbers are staggering. Since the policy's inception, authorities have expelled migrants at the border over 2.8 million times, according to U.S. Customs and Border Protection data. However, on May 23, 2022, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention CDC, announced that it was no longer necessary to maintain Title 42 given the current, more favorable public health outlook in the U.S. As the clock approached midnight last night we toured a popular border crossing here in brownsville texas across from matamoros and u.s border patrol officials tell us there are approximately 22,000 migrants in that region of tamalupas nuevo leon just waiting to cross into the united states the Biden administration's decision to suspend the controversial remain in mexico policy which forced asylum seekers to wait in mexico for their u.s immigration hearings has also had implications 
this policy, introduced in January 2019, enrolled approximately 70,000 migrants. Not only is the U.S.-Mexico southern border a hotbed for migrants, but it is also one for drug trafficking. Sinaloa cartel supplies most of the fentanyl in the U.S. and is largely responsible for more than 100,000 overdose deaths in 2021 alone. Recent data has shown a disturbing trend happening at the border. While overall drug seizures at the border may be trending down, seizures of fentanyl, a highly potent synthetic opioid, are skyrocketing. According to the latest data, most illicit fentanyl is smuggled through ports of entry at the southern border, contrary to the common belief that it is smuggled between ports. This revelation is nothing short of shocking, as it exposes the extent to which drug traffickers have infiltrated legal channels to bring their deadly products into the United States. The U.S. border with Canada also sees drug seizures, but fentanyl smuggling at the northern border is minimal compared to the southern border. This port of entry sees more fentanyl than any other port of entry in the U.S. In fact, over half of it is interdicted here. And the problem just keeps growing and growing and growing. In the first six months of 2023, officers have seized more fentanyl than they had in the last five years combined. This shocking disparity emphasizes the urgent need to address the ongoing crisis at the U.S.-Mexico border. The ongoing U.S.-Mexico border crisis has created a perfect storm for increased drug smuggling, particularly when it comes to the trafficking of illicit fentanyl. Despite efforts to fortify the border with fencing and physical barriers, there are still areas that remain vulnerable to illicit activities. Drug traffickers exploit these vulnerabilities, taking advantage of the vast and sometimes rugged terrain to smuggle drugs into the United States states. Organized crime syndicates also play a crucial role in facilitating drug smuggling operations. These criminal networks have established sophisticated and well-coordinated operations that span both sides of the border. They leverage their extensive networks, resources, and knowledge of the border region to smuggle drugs undetected. These criminal organizations operate with ruthless efficiency, constantly adapting their tactics to evade law enforcement and maximize their profits. The border crisis has also strained the resources and manpower of of law enforcement agencies. Border Patrol and other agencies tasked with securing the border are overwhelmed by the sheer volume of migrants and the need to process them. This diversion of resources and attention creates opportunities for drug traffickers to exploit the situation and smuggle drugs into the country undetected. Can the wall stop El Chapo? Jaw-dropping revelations from the notorious drug lord El Chapo's trial have exposed the ineffectiveness of the U.S.-Mexico border walls. Despite Trump's campaign promises, the trial uncovered a web of tunnels, hidden compartments, and corrupt officials that allowed El Chapo's Sinaloa cartel to continue their drug trafficking operations with impunity. However, as the trial of El Chapo unfolded, it became clear that the reality was far more complex than campaign rhetoric. El Chapo's empire seemed to operate with impunity, despite the presence of border walls. The trial provided a deep look inside the Sinaloa cartel's drug empire, revealing shocking details about their methods of smuggling drugs into the United States. One of the most astonishing revelations was the extensive network of tunnels that El Chapo's cartel utilized to transport drugs across the border. Six people are under arrest tonight after U.S. authorities discovered a drug tunnel between San Diego and Tijuana. The tunnel, the length of six football fields and six stories below ground, has rail tracks, ventilation, and electricity. These tunnels, equipped with ventilation systems, lighting, and even railway tracks, allowed for the seamless movement of drugs from Mexico into the United States. They were strategically built to bypass border security measures, rendering the border walls ineffective in stopping the flow of drugs. The tunnels were like a hidden highway for the cartel. These tunnels, some of which were built with astonishing precision, originated from unexpected places, like below a pool table at an estate. They allowed the cartel to transport massive quantities of drugs under undetected, bypassing any physical barriers that stood in their way. They were incredibly sophisticated, with reinforced walls and even hydraulic systems to conceal their entrances. It was like a game of cat and mouse, with the cartel always finding new ways to outsmart law enforcement. However, the tunnels were just the beginning. El Chapo's associates revealed jaw-dropping details of their smuggling techniques. Here's a, an example of what we're getting in tires. So they'll get four of these together to make a circle bolt them around the rim of the tire. Drugs were concealed in trucks and trains, camouflaged among gallons of cooking oil or hidden in small cans of hot peppers. These vehicles would pass through official entry points, making it incredibly difficult for authorities to identify and intercept the illicit cargo. Where we've had to completely disassemble engines 
to get to packages of narcotics. With the engine running, the Sinaloa cartel's operations were so sophisticated that they even utilized container ships docking at Pacific ports to transport their drugs into the United States. The trial also exposed the use of hidden compartments in vehicles, the exploitation of legal border crossings, and the employment of drug mules to smuggle drugs across the border. These tactics further highlighted the limitations of border walls in preventing drug trafficking. The wall, with all its grandeur, has become nothing more than a mere obstacle in their path. But perhaps the most shocking aspect of the trial was the revelation of widespread corruption within law enforcement agencies, as billions of dollars worth of heroin, cocaine, methamphetamines, and marijuana flowed into the United States, the Sinaloa cartel's power and influence grew exponentially. El Chapo's ability to quickly transport drugs and establish connections with Colombian cartels further solidified his empire. He sought to corrupt officials at every level of the Mexican government, ensuring that his operations remained virtually untouchable. Witnesses tested testified about bribes paid to officials to ensure the smooth passage of drugs across the border, including claims that El Chapo had bribed former Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto with $100 million. A spokesman for former Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto calls the bribery claim, quote, false and defamatory. Despite Trump's campaign promises, the trial uncovered a web of tunnels, hidden compartments, and corrupt officials that allowed El Chapo's Sinaloa cartel to continue their drug trafficking operations with impunity. El Chapo's Notorious Prison Breaks Now that El Chapo has requested to be repatriated to Mexico, especially during the ongoing U.S.-Mexican border crisis, it has raised concerns. If El Chapo were to be returned to Mexico, he would likely face a lower level of security and surveillance than in the U.S., and could potentially exploit the chaos and corruption at the border to escape the Mexican prison again, like he had done twice in the past, or resume his drug trafficking and criminal activities. In the early 2000s, the world witnessed one of the most audacious prison breaks in history. El Chapo had been locked up at Mexico's Puente Grande maximum security prison since 1995. His involvement in a bloody shootout at the Guadalajara airport in 1993 earned him a life sentence. But El Chapo had other plans. Puente Grande prison, located outside the city of Guadalajara, was known for its strict security measures. It seemed impenetrable, with high walls, armed guards, and advanced surveillance systems. But El Chapo was not one to be confined by mere walls. El Chapo had enjoyed certain comforts during his time at Puente Grande, thanks to his patronage of Damaso López Núñez, the deputy director of security. El Chapo's wealth and influence allowed him to live a life of relative luxury within the prison walls. He had access to good food and women, and even enjoyed playing volleyball. Damaso López Núñez, also known as El Chito, had taken over as deputy director of security in 1999. He proved to be even more pliant than his predecessor, ensuring that all of El Chapo's needs were met. El Chapo showered Damaso with money and gifts, solidifying their alliance. El Chapo's cell became his sanctuary, a place where he could plan his next move. But his comfortable life took a turn when Damaso left Puente Grande under suspicion of corruption. The departure of his ally left El Chapo vulnerable, and his worst fear became a reality. The Supreme Court of Mexico has ruled that the United States can extradite Mexican prisoners, including El Chapo, as long as the death penalty is off the table. This ruling brings El Chapo's worst nightmare, an American prison cell, closer to reality. It was January 19, 2001 when El Chapo made his move. The details of his escape remain a subject of speculation and controversy. Some believe that he was smuggled out in a laundry cart, while others argue that he simply walked out the door. The laundry cart theory suggests that El Chapo was hidden in a cart filled with dirty laundry, rolled to freedom by a guard known as El Chito. This daring escape plan allowed El Chapo to evade detection and slip past the prison's security measures. After more than a decade on the run, Guzman was finally apprehended in February 2014 at a beach resort in Mazatlan, Mexico. However, in July 2015, this notorious kingpin made another daring escape from the Altiplano Federal Prison the second time, was supposedly an impenetrable fortress designed to hold the most dangerous criminals. Altiplano Federal Prison, located in Almoloya de Juarez, Mexico, was known for its high security measures and strict protocols. Guards were trained to be vigilant, and the facility was equipped with state-of-the-art surveillance systems. However, these measures proved to be no match for the cunning and resourcefulness of El Chapo. Unbeknownst to the prison authorities, a team of skilled engineers and cartel members had been working tirelessly to construct an elaborate tunnel that would lead directly to Guzman's cell. The tunnel, measuring approximately one mile in length, was a feat of engineering marvel. It was equipped with ventilation systems, lighting, and even a motorcycle mounted on tracks to aid in the excavation process. The construction of such an intricate tunnel required not only technical expertise, 
expertise, but also a network of individuals willing to collaborate with the Sinaloa cartel. It is believed that prison staff, either coerced or bribed, played a crucial role in facilitating the escape. On the night of July 11, 2015, as the world slept, Guzman made his move. With the help of his accomplices, he crawled through the tunnel, emerging into the darkness outside the prison walls. It wasn't until the following morning, during a routine check, that prison guards discovered Guzman's absence. Panic ensued as the realization of his escape set in. After months on the run, the manhunt for El Chapo finally came to an end. On January 8, 2016, Mexican Marines raided a safe house in Los Mochis, Sinaloa, where Guzman was hiding. A fierce gun battle ensued, resulting in the deaths of several cartel members and the capture of El Chapo. El Chapo poses a threat to the stability and safety of the US and Mexico, as well as the region, by reigniting the drug war and violence that has claimed thousands of lives. El Chapo's repatriation to Mexico would be a dangerous scenario for both the US and Mexico, as well as the migrants and the citizens who live near the border. Although President Obrador has not given him a definite answer, it would be better for El Chapo to remain in the US, where he is serving his life sentence and has no chance of escaping or harming anyone. Drug Lord Behind Bars As we delve into the world of El Chapo and the Sinaloa cartel, it is crucial to understand the rise of this notorious drug lord and the empire he built. Joaquin Guzman, Loera, better known as El Chapo, was born on April 4, 1957, in the rugged mountains of Sinaloa, Mexico. From humble beginnings, El Chapo would go on to become one of the most powerful and feared figures in the global drug trade. El Chapo's journey into the world of drug trafficking began in the 1970s, when he joined the Guadalajara cartel, led by Miguel Ángel Félix Gallardo. El Chapo quickly proved his worth, displaying an uncanny ability to navigate the complex web of drug smuggling routes that crisscrossed the U.S.-Mexico border. But as the saying goes, power corrupts, and Guzman's hunger for control soon led to a deadly power struggle within the cartel. In 1989, Felix Gallardo was arrested, leaving a power vacuum that Guzman was more than willing to fill. With his cunning and ruthlessness, El Chapo swiftly eliminated his rivals, solidifying his position as the head of the Sinaloa cartel. But it wasn't just his brutality that set him apart, it was his unparalleled ability to transport drugs into the United States at an astonishing speed. El Chapo earned the nickname El Rapido for his lightning-fast operations. His cartel utilized a vast network of underground tunnels, hidden compartments, in vehicles, and other ingenious methods to smuggle drugs across the U.S.-Mexico border. The Sinaloa cartel, named after the Mexican state where it originated, would soon become synonymous with power, violence, and unimaginable wealth. El Chapo's cartel quickly gained control over key drug trafficking routes, smuggling vast quantities of cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamine into the United States. Their operations extended from the bustling cities of Los Angeles and Chicago to the remote corners of rural America. What set the Sinaloa cartel apart was their ability to adapt and innovate. El Chapo and his associates pioneered the use of sophisticated tunnels, hidden compartments in vehicles, and even submarines to transport drugs across the border. These ingenious methods allowed them to evade law enforcement and maximize their profits. The cartel's reach extended far beyond the drug trade, with involvement in extortion, kidnapping, and even political corruption. The rise of El Chapo and the Sinaloa cartel was not without its challenges. Rival cartels, such as the Gulf cartel and the Zetas, posed a constant threat to their dominance. Violent clashes between these criminal organizations would often result in bloodshed and chaos. However, El Chapo's strategic mind and iron grip on his organization ensured that the Sinaloa cartel remained a force to be reckoned with. Despite numerous attempts by law enforcement agencies to bring him to justice, El Chapo seemed untouchable. He became a master of evasion, constantly on the move and changing his appearance to avoid capture. The Mexican government, along with the United States Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, launched multiple operations to apprehend him, but each time, El Chapo managed to slip through their fingers. The audacity of El Chapo's operations and his ability to outsmart authorities time and time again made him a legendary figure in the criminal underworld. His influence extended beyond the drug trade, with some even considering him a modern-day Robin Hood, providing for the impoverished community 
cities in Sinaloa. However, it is important to remember that behind the myth and folklore lies a man responsible for countless lives lost and communities destroyed by the devastating effects of drug addiction. The impact of El Chapo's extradition to the United States on January 19, 2017 was felt not only in Mexico but also across international borders. It marked a significant milestone in the fight against drug trafficking as it signaled a commitment to holding high-profile criminals accountable for their actions. El Chapo's extradition demonstrated the cooperation between Mexican and American authorities in their shared goal of dismantling the Sinaloa cartel. While El Chapo's capture and extradition dealt a blow to the Sinaloa cartel, it did not eradicate the organization or put an end to drug trafficking. The cartel's operations continue, albeit with new leaders emerging to fill the void left by El Chapo. The drug trade is a multi-billion dollar industry that thrives on the insatiable demand for illicit substances. As long as there is a market, there will always be those willing to take risks and exploit vulnerabilities in the system. El Chapo's arrest created a power vacuum within the Sinaloa cartel, but the organization quickly adapted. His sons, Ivan Archivaldo and Jesus Alfredo, took over the reins, ensuring that the cartel's operations continued uninterrupted. The Sinaloa cartel's influence remained strong, and its ability to smuggle drugs into the United States remained undiminished. Today, El Chapo may be behind bars, serving a life sentence in a maximum security prison in the United States, but his legacy lives on. The Sinaloa cartel, with its vast resources, corrupt connections and ruthless tactics, continues to dominate the drug trade, fueling addiction, violence, and crime on both sides of the border. And that's it for this video. If you want to see similar stories like this, click on one of the cards on the screen.